and you can write this down the most important pursuit in life is to be single totally single say that with me say it again loud together the most important thing in life is to be totally single say it again the most important thing in life is to be totally single I know you don't believe that yet so I'm going to prove that before we leave here number two singleness is the foundation of all relationships say that with me singleness is the foundation of all relationships and that includes you and your boss student and teacher parents and children citizens and politicians friends colleagues and of course in relationships that are more intimate like marriage your singleness is the foundation of all of those relationships how you get along on your job is totally determined by your singleness number three singleness determines the quality of relationships personally socially and professionally I want you to take this to heart please if you are having problems on your job getting along with people that's a singleness problem if you always seem to have tension with people in your office or on the job as a plumber or always having fights and stress relationships in in your department or on the police force or in the hotel wherever you work that's a sign that you are suffering from a singleness problem if you're having problems personally with your spouse that's a sign that you and your spouse are both perhaps struggling with a singleness problem I want to prove that tonight from some facts based on scripture let me first of all begin with this concept the most important relationship in life is not interpersonal relationship most of us probably focus too much on getting along with other people matter of fact this is why I got single bars and single dance and single boat rides and single everyone trying to go to these places so you can get along with someone else or find someone else and I want to suggest to you that that is not your priority your most important relationship is not interpersonal relationship, but it is intra-personal relationship. Your first and most important relationship you should develop is not with other people, but with yourself. That is called intra-personal relationships. And why is this so important? Because the most important person you should desire to know is not other people, but yourself. And the average person in this planet know very little about the truth about themselves. They keep putting on other people's images. We live other people's expectations. We, we allow society to create us. And instead of having a self-concept, we have an other concept. That means we have a picture that people want us to look like. And this third point is important. Self-knowledge is the key to all relationships. Even knowledge of your strengths may be important to you, but also your weaknesses are important. You have to know where you are weak. Because if you don't know where you are weak in your own self, that will become a hindrance to all relationships you have. You need to know what you have to manage. I think a lot of us know some things about ourselves that we deny. We sometimes want to say that someone made us do certain things when in fact we decided to do it because of our tendencies and we need to manage those things we must be careful that we don't blame other people for ourselves and point number four the most important person for you to love is not other people but it's you if I was to 
say my most important point tonight, this is it right here. The most important person for you to love is you. Say that with me. The most important person for me to love is myself. Say it again. The most important person for me to love is who? Myself. I want to prove that also tonight because that is part of your conditions of stress. We always talk about loving our neighbor. And we even misquote the scriptures in this regard. But let me just give you something. Uh, let's look at the scripture for a minute where we get this idea from. Jesus was asked a question by someone. And it's a very important question. And to understand the question, you got to understand who was talking. The person who asked him the question was a Pharisee. A Pharisee was a religious leader of that day. Pharisees were trained in all the laws of Moses and the prophets. There were 669 laws, write that down, you're going to remember that, that the Pharisees tried to obey. In other words, they studied the whole Old Testament, especially the first five books called the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, and they extracted every single law or anything that looks like a law, they extracted it because they wanted to obey them so they could be righteous before God. So there were 669 laws when they counted them up. Now that's a lot of laws to try and remember. Uh, I won't talk about trying to keep. No wonder why they were always frustrated because they were far, you see. That's why they call it a sad, you see. They were sad, you see. They, they were trying to do this stuff that was so tough. And uh, it's, 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 it's very interesting. One of them came to Jesus and asked a very important question. And I think it's the kind of question you and I would, would want to ask too. In other words, look. I grew up in my father's Jewish house. I've been to the synagogue. I took theology. I'm a Pharisee. You know, I've been trying to get this thing to work for the last, you know, 50 years of my life. Look, Jesus, you seem to be very smart. Okay. Can you tell me, out of all the 69 laws... Here was a question. Which one is the greatest to, to keep? In other words, if I was going to keep one law more than all the others, what's the most important law for a human to keep before God? That was a good question. Because 669, just too many to remember. And I won't even talk about trying to keep. So can you boil it down for me, Jesus? Just break it down. Just, just give me the, the main one. And his answer blew their minds. He, he didn't say, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't curse, don't worship other gods. He didn't say that. He just said the most important law is this. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all of your mind. And then he did something the man didn't ask. The man asked him for one answer. And that's important. But he gave him two answers to one question. Why? Because he couldn't answer the, uh, the question with one answer. Because the question required two answers. Now notice what the answers were. He said, first of all, you should love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. But then he kicks in. He says, oh, and the second one is just like the first. Now the man didn't ask you for the second one. There's only one question. But he see, Jesus said, look, the second one is connected to the first. Love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. See, a lot of us find it easy to say we love God. We, we worship, we give, you know, I love you, Lord, and I praise you, Lord. And, you know, you are faithful to church, and you're always going out to you know, these meetings and prayer meetings, and, you know, you go witnessing, and, and God said, okay, that's fine, but what about the second part? I know you love me. But he says, the second one is just like the first one which means they are equal this is deep he says and the second one is like the first one and here it is you must love your neighbor as you love yourself and then he says all the 669 laws are in this one law if you keep this one law you don't need the 669 love God love yourself 
Love your neighbor. Now, I want you to read that voice very carefully. He did not say, love your neighbor first. And that's where we keep making a mistake. We keep trying to love people without the prerequisite. Let me break it down for you. I, re I did a research on this verse when I was in school in university. It's one of the verses that I researched with my professor who's going to be here uh, next week, Dr. Jerry Horner. He was the leading and still is one of the leading Greek scholars in the entire United States. He helped, he helped to translate the NIV Bible. He also translated this New Spirit Bible. This, this guy is good. He'll be with us next week. Make sure I don't miss him being here. You will go advance like that when you read the Bible. The guy is good. But in his class at, at university, I remember him, we went through this whole chapter, and it shocked me when he gave us the meaning of the root word that Jesus used. First, it says, it says love God, which means to pursue and focus on God's character and God's nature and God's qualities. When you love someone, you want to pursue them. You want to understand them. You want to get to know them. You want to be with them. Why? You want to understand how they think, what they need, what they want, what their desires are. He said, do that for God. Pursue God with all your might. Get to know God's qualities, his characteristics, his nature, what he's like. Stay with God so you can know God. But then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And here's the words that are used here in the original Greek. It means to the same degree. Love your neighbor to the same degree that you love yourself. In other words, the same measure that you love yourself is how you will love your neighbor, Jesus says. The implication is loving God should result in self-love and then self-love qualifies you to love other love. Put it another way. You can only love others to the same degree and measure you love yourself. Write that down. Very important. Stop trying to love people first. This is why you got hurt. If you don't love yourself, you need people to love you. And when they disappoint you, the whole bottom falls out. Because now you don't feel loved again. If I love me and you don't love me, I am still loved. So if you keep your love from me, I still satisfy because I loved me before you met me and I met you. So if you leave me, I still love me. So Christ is saying, look, the key is fall in love with yourself first. But that's not enough. He says, and the same measure you love yourself is the only measure you can love other people. So write this down. This is one of my favorite statements from, I was 16 years old. And it goes like this. It is more important to love you than to love me. In other words, when anyone asks you or tells you they love you, your response should not be, I love you too. Wrong response. According to the kingdom of God that Jesus is establishing, he said, when they tell you, I love you, your response should be, but do you love you? <laughs> Why? Because if you don't love you, you cannot love me, so you lying. In other words, it's more important for you to love you than to love me. And I got to make sure you love you before you try to love me, because you can't love me more than you love you, so you better love you plenty. <laughs> Am I getting through? See... This is why we are difficult to other people. We're trying to get them to love us so we can feel loved. That's why we're so manipulated by people. It's a sign of self-hatred. People say, I'll do anything for you. No, hold it, hold it. Don't you ever do that. And that's why it didn't work out for some of you. Because you went in looking for love. And whenever you go in looking for love, they can control you 100%. Because they can threaten to take it back any time. Loneliness is a manifestation of self-hatred. Let me put it another way, please. Write this down. Seven ways to self-love. Please, this is good stuff. Write this down. This is fresh from manna of heaven. Number one, self-love is a result of self-discovery. I need another seminar to teach that all by itself. You got to discover yourself first or you'll never love yourself. Number two, self-love is a result of self-source. What I mean by that is you have to discover where yourself was sourced. Where did you come from? You cannot love yourself if you don't know where you came from. 
Because source determines value. Oh boy. In other words, if I, if I used, uh, if I took a piece of rock and I cut it in half, does it become anything else? No, it's just a piece of a rock again. And if I cut it again, what it becomes? A piece of rock again. In other words, whatever it was originally, no matter how I break it down, that's what it is. So if I took a diamond and I cut it in half, whatever, what I got? Two diamonds. Cut it again, I got what? Four diamonds. So now, you see, it maintains the value. So if you, if, if, if you don't know your source, you don't know your value. Number three, self-love is a result of self-worth. You can never give yourself worth if you don't know where you came from. And you can't know where you came from if you don't discover yourself and discover your source. In other words, you are suffering from other people's value of you. And that's why you need them to keep giving you value. Or sometimes we create value out of the things we collect. That's why the fashion industry controls your life and you're broke and depressed. Because you keep trying to buy things to give yourself value because you ain't know how much you're worth. This is why you collect cars with big names and dresses with fancy, you know, uh, brand names and shoes with brand names. And you want to live in a certain area. Why? Because that whole thing has to do with a lack of self-love. It's you need to collect things to give yourself value. That's why when you lose them, you really go crazy. Self-worth. Number four. Self-love is a result of self-esteem. Esteem means how much do you estimate you cost or worth? What is your estimate of your value? And some people, is, it is so low, they sell themselves on the street for prostitution. Sometimes they sell themselves sophisticatedly in their jobs. Or even sell themselves in a relationship that they know they shouldn't go that low, but they don't have any estimation of their true value and so they sell themselves cheap on the altar of compromise just to have company around them what a tragedy you shouldn't marry anybody to make you feel important forget it <laughs> self love is a result of self esteem when you realize how much you are worth you fall in love with yourself. Let me, let me give an example. If I gave you a plastic ring out of a Cracker Jack box and then gave you a $10,000 diamond ring and gave you both of them, which one would you really love the most? Isn't that amazing? Which one would you want to know where it is all the time? You don't care where the plastic ring is. Which one do you put in a nice leather pouch and, you know, you put it in a private place, maybe in a, you know, okay. In a safety deposit, yeah. I mean, I mean the plastic. <clears throat> See, self estimation makes you treat yourself with leather pouch experience. Don't touch this. <laughs> I just can't go anywhere. I am diamond. The same plastic. I can't be seen just with anybody. Come on, y'all talk to me, man. See it. But it has to do with your self-esteem. Self-love. That's why Christ says that's the most important love on earth. Not the love for your neighbor. And number five. Self-love is a result of self-concept. Concept has to do with picture. It's, the word concept means idea or picture. How do you picture yourself determines... How you treat yourself. And that picture comes from your discovery of where you came from. You know, a diamond is a diamond is a diamond. You ever heard that? And it's a rose is a rose is a rose. In other words, once the thing is it, that's what it is. And so your picture of yourself doesn't come from other people. But we keep getting it from them. Oh, you look nice. Well, listen, I don't need you to tell me I look nice. I told myself that this morning before I left. And if you never told me, I still know I look nice. Because I'm cool, man. This is me. I love me, self. You, know, you understand me? See, self-concept, you don't walk around allowing people to paint you how you should feel about yourself. You're supposed to know who you are. You know, 
I was thinking tonight when I was preparing to come to talk, I said, you know, Jesus Christ would not have gotten along well with most of us. He was opposite to what my mother and father taught me in the same island when I was a little boy. They said, son, never talk about yourself. And I think that came from the British oppression, colonialism, where we were taught that we were nothing, you know. So, so my mom is, they really thought that, boy, stop talking about yourself. Stop talking about yourself, boy. You know, you know, be considerate and stop talking about yourself. Now, now you see, that may sound nice, but that's stupid. That's what causes low self-esteem. When your child says, well, mommy, I'm good at this. Boy, don't say you're good, you know. Uh, no, stop that. Stop, you know, talking big about yourself. And they will correct you from feeling good about yourself. Now, here comes Jesus. He would not get along with us. Every day, all day, the guy was into himself. He had a picture of himself that was almost irritating. And it was irritating. That's why the Pharisees who had low self-esteem attacked him all the time. Because he kept using this word. I. And that's the way my mother said, you never use that word, son. Stop saying I. Remember that? Some of you all go with that. I. His I was constant. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the resurrection. I am the sheep gate. I am the way. I am the life. I am the bread. I am the water. I am the resurrection. I, I, I. Brother, you a lot of I. Yes, I am. That's why I don't need your opinion to tell me who I am. Now here's what mesmerized me about Jesus. Write this down. I never, this, this changed my life at 18. I, I wrote it down at 18. He never spoke negative about himself. Hallelujah. Number two, he never accepted anybody's opinion of himself. Because when you have a sense of self-concept, your own picture, that other people's opinion don't touch you. Their perception don't touch you. You got to be very important to be able to say to yourself, I am. If you don't know who you are, we'll tell you who you should be. And there's your problem. Have you ever seen people this? One of the signs of self-hatred is when you take people shopping with you all the time. Oh, oh, I'm in trouble now, see? But I'm going to say it, see? He said, let's go shopping. Okay, well, okay, okay, we go shopping. I ain't got a problem with that. that. That part is okay. You know, you want friends, that's fine. But when you go to a store, and you put on something that you like, and then you come out of the dressing room and say, what do you think? And she says, mm-mm, you go take it off. Now, that's stupid. That is crazy. If you like it, honey, that's, listen, this is my body. Forget what you think. I love me. I like this. Clap, clap, clap. Praise God. But that's a sign of self-hatred, see? Why? You want to dress to please the person. It's a sign of self-hatred. And I know I have seen some things that people wore that other people liked, but it didn't look good on them. I've seen some things. I told my wife sometime, she didn't see herself leaving the house today. I know that. No one would come out of the house looking like that. But they were dressed for other people. Self-hatred. Number six, self-love is a result of self-identity. Once you, when you know who you are, you fall in love with yourself. Number seven, self-love is a result of self-value. How much do you value yourself? That gives you your love for yourself. If you believe you are valuable, you fall in love with yourself. Just like that ring, that's diamond or plastic. So discovery of your identity determines your attitude towards yourself and that determines the measure of love of yourself and that determines how much you can love me. I think this is a very important night because we've been asking people the wrong questions. You should never ask someone, do you love me? That's the wrong question first. First question, but excuse me, do you love you? That never is asked. And that is the question. And if they are shocked by the question, leave fast. Because right away you know, they don't even know what you're talking about, see? This is why marriages don't work. People go into marriage looking for love. You don't go to marriage looking for love. You go to marriage because you already love yourself and you want to share that with someone else. That's all. You ain't looking for none. You got it already. Very important. 
And number, number seven, self-value. And here's some point I want to make here. Self-love is the source of true singleness. I think you're feeling it already. That's why I always tell people, you ain't single yet. Singleness is the most important relationship in the world. Because singleness is being totally in love with yourself first. Singleness means that you love yourself so much, if no one loves you, you're still happy. Singleness means that your best friend is yourself. You can spend all day with yourself and take yourself out for dinner. Oh, come on. I feel like shouting all by myself. And believe me, I could do it all the time. Even as a married man, take myself out for dinner and order stuff for myself. Love myself. That's why my wife is so safe, because I love myself. I won't say that too deep. Okay. Ten manifest things of self-love. This is a measure. Write this down. This will tell you if you love yourself. Okay? So you can measure it when you go home. Study this for the next three days. Come back every session. And remember, this is what we want to focus on. If you're going to be single and affluent and an influencer, you got to begin with self-love. Here's how you know if you love yourself. Number one, self-confidence. Total confidence. And by the way, when people who don't love themselves meet a person who does love themselves, they always consider them arrogant. Because their insecurity is intimidated by their security, and so they call that arrogance. It's not arrogance. They just love themselves. Number two, self-love is manifested in self-respect. If you believe you are a diamond, you don't just put yourself in any situation, go with anybody, you know, wear anything. You have self-respect. It's a sign of self-love. You got your breasts out with no bra and a thin see-through blouse. That tells me a lot about how you feel about yourself. You ain't got to tell me nothing. I can see. Oh, come on, clap anyhow. Praise God. Yeah, you shouldn't be that cheap around the world, selling yourself free and no one paying for it. Everyone watching, looking at you. You just lowered your value. It's a sign that you have no self-respect. Number three, self-love is manifested in self-assurance. A self-assured person, somebody who seems so assured, they almost intimidate you. They're bold, they are confident, they, they're not afraid. They, they just believe, they just know, and they make you feel afraid. That's self-love. Number four, self-love is self-assertiveness. When a person has love for themselves, they assert themselves. Now, it's, it's, um, they, they don't do it to try and be pushy. Assert means that they believe they got something to offer, so they offer it. And that could be advice, direction, input. Then, in other words, look, you don't know what you're doing. Let me, let me give you some advice. <laughs> And you may call that pushy. No, that's self-love being manifested. It is someone saying, look, I know what I believe, and I know in whom I believe, and I got something that you could use. <laughs> Number five, self-love is manifested in self-motivation. When a person loves themselves, they are internally motivated. Yeah. They don't depend on people to get them going. <laughs> when you love yourself, you manage your own feelings. Yeah. You decide what to do every morning yourself. You don't need no one to give you no schedule. You make your own schedule in life when you love yourself. When you love yourself, you believe that you are so important that you need to plan to give your life to the world today. Number six, self-love is manifested, write this down, in self-values. Self-value means a person who loves themselves place value on their lives so high that they don't come down to meet nobody. They bring people up where they are. They value the things that are important to them. Number seven, self-love is manifested in self-giving. And this one is very key. Notice Jesus said, he said, you can only love your neighbor if you love yourself. In other words, you can't give me what you ain't got for yourself. So self-love provides you with the equipment to give yourself to somebody else without expecting anything back. Let me put, you, put it another way. If I don't need you to love me, and I love you, if you don't love me back, that don't matter to me. I went too fast. Let me try it again. I love me. I meet you. I love you. But I don't need you to love me because I loved me before I met you. So if you withhold your love, even though I love you, that doesn't take away anything from me because I love me before I met you. So I don't love you to get love from you. I love you because I am full of love of myself. 
That's why Jesus Christ could die for us. And we turn our back and curse him. Why? Because it wasn't a matter of him needing love back. You don't understand love. He knew that he was so valuable that you needed what he had. And whether you received it or not, didn't matter. Because he had it before you even received it or not received it. Self-love is able to give itself without manipulating people. Number eight, self-love is self-affirmed. Self-affirmation. Self-affirmation means when you love yourself, you tell yourself you love yourself. <laughs> you don't go around saying, what do you think? No, 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 no. This is what I think. I like this. <laughs> Self-affirmation means you congratulate yourself. But not, 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 not what I did, that was pretty good. And some of y'all got ideas but that ain't. Listen, you know, I'm just like my daddy. My daddy's an amazing daddy. My daddy did this. 500 million galaxies. And then my daddy says, that's good. Come on, clap. My daddy. That's good. <laughs> and then he made you, he said, now that's very good. See, when you have a good love for yourself, God is what? God is love. That's why he tell himself, ah, that's good. If you wait around to be approved by everybody, that's a sign that you have self-hatred. You need other people to give you value. You know, if you love yourself, when you didn't do a good job. So you tell yourself, now that's not as good as I could be. I'll be back. <laughs> Self-love gives you the confidence to be able to give yourself away and affirm yourself. And this is why self-loved people are not manipulated by anyone. This is why criticism runs off their backs like water on a cat. It's, 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 it's not because they can't feel, you know. It's just that their feelings are not out for manipulation. Yes, that's right. Number nine, self-love is manifested in self-forgiving. Now, this one is very deep. The average person in this room have not forgiven themselves for a lot of things yet. And you, sometimes you think you do, but you keep carrying this weight. Boy, what I did five years ago, I don't know. That, that's a, and, and you carry this thing. Oh, the things I did last year, man. See, and you can't, listen, when a person loves themselves, they actually have a good nature with themselves and they say, you know, that was dumb what I did last week. <laughs> now, you know better than that, Miles. Why you did that? Stop doing that. Yes, Miles. Okay. <laughs> See? They, and they forgive themselves. We walk around trying to get people to forgive us when in fact we haven't forgiven ourselves. Now remember, you can't do for others what you haven't done for yourself. So if you ain't forgiven yourself, you can't forgive me. And number 10, self-love is manifested in self-investing. Okay, if I gave you a diamond ring, would you pay to secure it? I'd say a $50,000 diamond ring. Would you just put it on the, on the floor? No, you would pay to get some kind of security for that, right? You'd even pay maybe for, what do you call them, box? Safety deposit. Yeah, you would pay monthly for safety deposit box. Why? Because it's valuable. Right. In other words, you would invest in something that is valuable. Wow. Now, you wouldn't get a safety deposit box for a plastic ring or a Cracker Jack oh, box. Wow. In other words, investment is a measure of value. Yeah, that's right. yeah. I love myself so much that I read, at least I try to read four books a month. I keep investing in myself. Come on, I think I have something important to offer the world. So I keep expanding my mind, expanding my concepts, learning new things, so I can learn how to be more effective. I keep investing in myself. Why? I love myself. Then I make sure I eat good food, and I try to pay a little extra to get healthy food. You know, instead of drinking, you know, just the, 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 the juice drink, I drink the, the pulp, you know, so the pulp drinks. You know, so, and it might be a little extra, but I love myself, see? And I so invest in myself, because I want to be strong and always ready to go, you know. At age 54, man, you want to fight? Come on. No. In, in other words, when you love something, you invest in it. So here's a guy sucking on a cigarette. I tell me right away, the guy don't love his lungs. Self-love determines what you invest in. You invest to go back to evening school to take a course that you didn't get because you love yourself. 
You decide you're going to lose 20 pounds because the doctor says this ain't good for your heart and you love yourself so much. You can invest in getting up early in the morning, a little extra jogging, you know, stop going to the all you can eat section, you know. You then invest in yourself. Why? Because you love yourself. Some folks just let themselves go and that's a sign that they don't love all of themselves. Sometimes they love the intellect but they don't love the body. Where is your self-love? You talk about singleness. Write this down. This is very important. Every human was created to influence the world. And I want to, to just bring these three words to you tonight and let the others pick up on these words. I want them to write definitions down. I did a lot of research for you the last few days. Okay. Singleness and influence. Let's talk about that. When you fall in love with yourself, what happens after that? Well, here's a, a thought. Every human was created to influence their world. So when we talk about influence as a single, that includes you. But I get some answers for you tonight. Influence is defined as the capacity to impact one's environment. That includes the people and circumstances through presence, performance, personality, and competence. Write those words down. If you want to be an impact in the world before you die, you need those words in your life. Presence, performance, personality, and competence. You become an influence when those four things are developed in your life. Now, presence means that when you walk into a place, just walking into the place could have an impact. That's a sign that you have influence. Secondly, performance. Performance means you are so good at what you do that you demand respect. So you become an influence. You know, if Michael Jordan says, let me say a few words about basketball, everybody shuts up. Why? Because he has proven by his performance he knows the game. So he has influence over that whole area. Number three, personality. Now, personality has to do with your person that you ality. <laughs> the person that you display. How you walk. How you greet people. How you present yourself physically, visually, smiling, confidence, not being brash, having dignity, physical dignity. That's personality. And this last one is important, competence. If you meet somebody with a PhD in physics, all of a sudden they have influence. You get a PhD in anything, you have influence when you walk in the room. Why? You took the time to get competence in that area. That's why they say knowledge is a source of influence. And the more knowledge you get, the more influential you become. You know, uh, this past week, I was with T.D. Jakes, 5,000 people. Yesterday I spoke in Atlanta with uh, Eddie Long, he just got back. <laughs> and, you know, he, they had about maybe 7,000. And both of them invited me, one to Washington, T.D. Jakes, one to Atlanta yesterday, and they both said, we invited you because the material that we wanted you have, the content is what they use. So they flew me from my country and paid me to come and give them my content. Now, where did I get the content from? Same books that you ain't reading. And they think I'm smart. It's just that while you're watching TV, I'm reading. For the past 39 years. You could be on the phone for two hours and become stupid. Just talking dumb stuff. You know, shut the phone down and pick up a book and read a chapter you never knew. And let your mind be expanded and your competence increase. Some of you are on a job right now and that job is being threatened. My suggestion is to, to uh, beat them to the punch. Start, not the punch paper, I mean to the punch. Uh, start, <laughs> be careful with that joke. Uh, you have to start thinking now, what can I do to cut that off and get some competence in some other areas? What are you doing to diversify your education knowledge? 
What are you really good at that people will respect you for? When you walk in the room, they say, boy, that person can do that. Or who do they call on when they need certain things? That's a sign of influence. It's very important. Influence is earned. Please write this statement down. It is earned over time. And I wrote this very specifically and carefully so you can write this down. Influence is earned over time through the consistent commitment and dedication to a personal goal and a conviction and a discipline or a cause at the expense of self-preservation. Please write that down as a long sentence, but it'll help you in 20 years. In other words, influence is earned over time when people watch you and, and, and see you invest in refining your own self. You know, Nelson Mandela, for example, can fit this very easily. Nelson Mandela was a lawyer. He graduated from a school in London, went back to South Africa, and he had a problem. His conviction was that everybody was equal. His people were not being treated equal. So his conviction created a consistent commitment that took him in prison. In other words, he wasn't concerned about his own self-preservation. He believed in something so deeply, he was willing to pay a price for it. Now, paying the price is what earns you influence. If you go through hell and come out, people will respect you. That's why he came out of prison on Monday and was president on Tuesday. Well, he already paid the price for influence in the country. Why are you impressed with lawyers or doctors? The guy spent 14 years trying to get a specialization in, in medicine. So when he walks in there, he tells you, take your clothes off. Yes, sir. You take them off. The guy got influence. You're like, hey, I won't take my clothes off of anybody, but this guy's taking clothes off. You know, it's the influence over those preparation of those years and the price and the cost that he put in that makes you influenced by him. I can see you're using imagination. I can see the imagination. We do a lot of time. Take your pants off. I say, yes, sir. Take my pants off. But you see, they paid a price. Why? They were dedicated and committed to a specific goal or a specific discipline that earned them the right to have influence. What have you done long enough that we should be influenced by you and respect you for? Some of you haven't done anything yet. And you change jobs so fast. We didn't know what you specialize in. Matter of fact, most people are either Jack or Jacqueline. <laughs> Jacqueline of all the trades, you know. Master nothing. You have to master something to gain influence. And that's why we're here this week. Now, I want you to just write this, 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 this next statement down. This is a very important one. Singleness and success. I'm going to give you a secret here. And if you learn what I'm going to share with you, it doesn't matter what happened to the stock market. If you learn what I'm going to share with you, it doesn't matter the oil prices. I'm giving you the greatest secret of how to overcome every environment. It has to do with becoming single. How do you become an influence? Well, write this down. Influence power will produce leadership. And that may be as a sanitary worker or someone who is a housekeeper in the hotel, they can be leaders in their areas. It may be someone who sells perfume in a store. They, they know a thousand cents. They've been there for 50 years. They know how to, everything smells. They don't know every perfume. That's a competence. So don't just think of leaders as being prime minister. It could be someone selling shoes who have a thousand shoes, know every one of them in that store. They know exactly what they like, what they do, what they made it up. They know it. They are competent. But the problem is folks don't stay there working long enough to become competent. Influence produces leaders. Number two, influence power will result in personal success. And everyone in this auditorium wants to be successful personally. I know that. I ain't got no question about that. I know you want to be successful. That's why you breathe every morning, wake up every morning. You want to try one more time to be successful. I'm going to give you the secret to success right now. Here's how you become successful. The key to influence is value. Say that with me. The key to influence is value. Say it again. The key to influence is value. If you get that, you're on your way tonight. 
If you want to be influential, you must position yourself to become valuable. At least to number three. If you want to be successful, do not seek success. Seek to influence. It is the influencer that attracts finances. You know, Larry King, last night, chose to interview a guy who never graduated from college with a degree in business. His name is Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a real estate agent who became a real estate guru. The guy is worth billions, okay? But he started as a real estate agent, just like you, real estate. He's still in real estate. The stock market fell apart last night, dropped 509 points. Two big banks collapsed. Insurance company about to fold up, affecting the whole world. And Larry King calls as a real estate agent to give advice on his show last night. And I sat there and thought about it. I said, wow, why did he call this guy? Influence? The guy owned half of New York and ain't got no money. I read his book. You should read all of his books. He got some great books. Donald Trump books. Just buy them. He gives some secrets of how to, how to build wealth without money. And he says, your first enemy is fear. You look at the price too much. And this guy is worth billions. He said last night, he says, I sold one of my houses for $100 million last night, he says. A hundred million dollars for one house in Florida. My God. Oh. <laughs> I wish I was the broker. I'd retire in the morning. <laughs> Hundred million dollars one house. This guy, but Larry King called him why? Because he's been in it for years and he has become competent. And so they call on him because he is influence. This leads to the point number four. Seek to become a person of influence. Seek to become a person of value. The more valuable you become, the more influential you become. Okay, Pastor Miles, how do you become valuable? I'm going to tell you now. How do you become valuable? Here's how you become valuable. It's very important. Value is determined by the worth you bring to life. These are very important statements. What is, what is value? The worth you bring to life. The less worth you bring to life, the less you are paid. The less worth you bring to life, the less they value you. Remember that a salary is someone's value of your contribution. If you don't like your salary, don't ask for more money. Wrong issue. You got to produce more value. Make yourself more valuable. That may mean you got to go to night school and get an, another degree in something. That may mean you got to shut the TV off and start watching all those funny soap ops and start now investing in some unique areas of knowledge that will give you more value to that company. Stop asking for money. Money is attracted to value. You ever heard this? I've been here for 50 years. And that consultant came here for 50 hours and made 10 times what I'm making. They cheating. They ain't cheating. You've been there 50 years, but you've been doing the same thing. Same value. <laughs> We're getting quiet now, see? I'm trying to give you the secret to become valuable. Because as a single person, is it? if you're going to marry me, bring me some value. I don't want no deficit. I want an asset. If I'm going to marry you, Lord have mercy, help me. And it begins with, first of all, self-love. And self-love is the secret to worth. Let me explain it to you. Write this down, very important. Worth is determined by your significance. Oh, this is so critical. How significant are you to your community? It determines your value. I was called by the administrator of the hospital here in our country 
the main public hospital and she said we'd like for you to serve as the chairman of the hospital foundation board I said I'm so busy I can't take another assignment she says look we just want your name if we put your name on the letterhead we could ask for money she said she was that's it's a foundation to, to get money for different equipment in the hospital. In other words, she was saying, look, you are so valuable, just your name. The worth, what worth do you bring to someone's life? Do you step up when you marry someone or do you step down when you marry someone? Do, do they take you up? See, this is where the rubber really meets the road. You talk about influence, how much influence do you have? How much do you bring to me? Worth is determined by what? Significance. Now, here's the answer. How do you become significant? Here's a guy who you know. This guy never took a course in leadership, as far as we know. He never took a course in business management, as far as we know. The guy's a golfer. But he's a leader all over the world. And he attracts over $300 million a year just by lending his name to companies. Now, what made him so successful? Put those words down against his name that I gave you earlier. Influence. What? Competence. Who plays better than, than, than Tiger? Yeah. Performance. You, hey, just show him, a, show him the green. That means the golf course. Just show him the, show him the course and he performed for you. Personality. Man, the guy attract when he comes like he, 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 he come on, you're just smiling and just concentrate. The guy has personality. He brings drama to life. Just like I do, right? Like it. See? Personality creates influence. And then presence. When he walks on the court, three thousand people show up to watch golf for the first time in history. Just his presence turned the green into gold. How does it look when you show up? <laughs> Crab grass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I gotta go. Oh man, my time's gone. Anyhow, we'll finish this <laughs> some other time. <laughs> let, at least let me give you the secret. Can I give you the secret to, to significance? Oh, you want that, eh? Okay. I can, I can mean a second offering. All right, write this down. You can put Tiger Woods in all these principles I'm giving you. Number one, how to become significant. Number one, you were created to dominate life, but in an area of gifting. You have to understand that first. The influence that you have in life comes from your gift. So if you haven't found your gift, that's why you have no influence. Think for a minute. Number two, the gift that you were given were given to solve a problem on earth. You were born with a gift to solve a problem or to meet a need on earth. You have to believe that. Because that's the beginning of your significance. If you believe you're only born to work and pay bills and die, that's exactly what we'll do for you. We'll bury you and forget you. But I have come to tell 6.7 billion people sent by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that you are not a biological accident. You came to earth to do something so special and society doesn't want you to find it. Society doesn't. Because society and your culture have already peg holes for you to be in. The holes that they created. And they don't want you to violate their norm. And that's why all great people of influence become abnormal people. You cannot fit when you find your gift. Tiger Woods found his at four and a half years old. 
I read his story, my goodness. He was saying his daddy gave him that first Christmas gift. And his father took him out on the course. And when he hit the first ball, his father says, you got a gift. And from that day, he kept on buying him golf material. Little golf shoes, little golf balls, little golf, you know, in the uh, uh, rods. He's just got, I mean, just, and he kept on refining that gift. Number three, very critical. Your gift is your area of significance. You got to find it before you leave this conference. Every session, we're going to be working on that for you to find that gift. And I don't know how old you are. I really don't care. Abraham found his gift at 75. Your gift is not your job most of the times. And sometimes your job can smother your gift. Because they tell you what to do, not what you really were born to do. And so you're a victim of the organization. You know, in Bahamas Faith Ministries, we try to give people freedom to exercise their gifts in all the departments. We tell them, look, that's what we want done. Go ahead and develop. You know, and I push people. Sometimes they, don't, they, 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 they become overwhelmed by that. They don't know what to do. Because they come out of situations where they didn't have to think for themselves. And I try to create a culture of freedom. Hey, can you solve that problem? And it demands for you to make demands on your potential. Because I'm trying to define your gift. I'm trying to get you to identify what your strengths are. I write this one down, number four. Discovery, development, refinement, and serving of your gift to the world is the key to your significance. I'm going to repeat it again. The discovery, then the development, the refinement, and then serving that gift to the world is the key to your significance. And when you find that gift, you've got to develop it. You know, the books and the CDs we got out here are not for us to sell you products. They are filled with refinement systems. Every book that we've written is to have people have an encounter with their own gift. And to find God's will for their gift. And to identify God's will for his kingdom for you to function in that gift. Because that's your significance. And in that is your value. And that's what attracts wealth. Let me show you another thing that's very important. People are attracted to your gift, not to you personally. Write that down, please. You know, I'm going to say to you, uh, Vicky. And all of us who are, you know, sometimes in public all the time. People really ain't, it's not us they like. So we got to be careful. It's your gift. I remember Jesus asked a question one time. A lot of folks decided to, to join his organization one time. About over 70. And he became very nervous. And Jesus asked him a question. Why are you following me? And before they could answer, he told them, he says, Is it not because of the fish and bread I fed you yesterday? In other words, your guys are into me. You're into my gift. People will be attracted to your gift. Dr. Simmons is here today. He is a pediatrician. I think that's what they call you guys. Obstetrician. Some trician. Okay. And <laughs> okay. Now, I mean, people flocked him over the years by the thousands. He don't go look for them. They look for him. Why? They come in for the gift. They don't like him personally. I mean, some may get to you know, appreciate his personality, but they, it's the gift they come for. And guess what? They give you money for your gift. And that's why the secret to wealth is your gift. If you're going to be an, an, an influencer, first you've got to love yourself. Loving yourself will help you discover your gift. When you find your gift, you become valuable. Now you got to develop it, refine it. That means you got to change some of your company you're keeping. You got to focus specifically on a program. Start feeding yourself good material. Getting in the areas where people are in your area of gifting. Get to know people in your area of gifting. Get relationships. You know, take some courses. Go on some seminars and that gift. You want to develop, refine it. You got to refine it. Sometimes you got to leave your job to come to a seminar to build your gift. The future is not in any job. The future is in the person who's holding the job. So don't be married to a job. They'll take it from you tomorrow. And if your value comes from your job, you better never get fired. Let me repeat it again very slowly because Bahamians don't understand this sometimes. If your value comes from your job, you better pray they never fire you. You are more important than your title. You are more important than the position they gave you. That's why they can take it anytime they want. 
Let your value be in who you are in God. Discover that you are valuable. They can never take your gift. They can take their job, but they can't take your gift. You know, I, I'm amazed at someone like Pastor Barbara over there. You know, I know Barbara now for 29, 30 years. And the day I first met Barbara, she is a hospitality whiz. Didn't even to ask her. She says, Pastor, I want to be in hospitality. You know, she could sell spit. <laughs> Over a restaurant, just sell stuff. She, she, she will make you buy. By her hospitable spirit, it's a gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some folks, you know, the, the Chinese says, he who does not smile should not open a store. What they're saying is, you ain't got the personality, don't fool with that business. <laughs> we need to appreciate the gift. The gift is what attracts our wealth. And once you find your gift, you'll always have money. I'm going to prove it to you right now. Write this down. Your gift makes you valuable. And that's the heart of singleness. Stop looking for someone to marry and discover yourself first. And focus this week on who am I? What can I do? What is my gift? What can I bring to the world? What can I make a difference in the world with? How can I bring influence to the world? That's what we want to get in your heart this week. I got a little, I got a little, uh, a little suggestion for you unmarried people. Write this down. Your gift attracts wealth and affluence. You know, when you find your gift, you attract people. Perhaps a, pros a prospect. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you ain't valuable, people avoid you and then use you, that's all. They use you and then avoid you. But if you have a gift, you become attractive. And this is why people who are successful in their gifts can be very careful to manage their relationships. Do you know many women, I'm sure, try to connect with Dr. Simmons in that office? I'm sure there are thousands over the years. Why? When you get a gift, people are attracted to the gift. And they figure the gift got plenty of money. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, man. And, 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 see, so I'm a smart guy, see? Uh, <laughs> this is interesting. I, I tell you, this is an interesting story. And then I, 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 I close this down. Okay. I was at the elevator in Washington, D.C., in this beautiful Hyatt Hotel. And Morris Cirillo was having a meeting there. This is like two weeks ago. And... Uh, I wasn't speaking at that meeting. I speak at all of his meetings, and I you know, always do. But I wasn't at that meeting. I was at another conference in another place. And so I was standing at the elevator. My wife and I were there, and all these people in the, in the conference, all of them know me because I speak at those meetings often. They all knew me. So they ran to me, and they started making all this noise, you know, getting excited and everything. And some of them bought books for me to sign. And, and it wasn't my conference. I was just living in the same hotel. And this guy stood beside me, this tall guy. He said, oh, Dr. Munro, you shouldn't be at this elevator. I said, why? He said, you shouldn't be here. I said, why? He said, no, you shouldn't be here. Look at all these people. They're harassing you. I said, they're harassing me. I love these people. That's what I live for. I live for the people. I, I'm here to serve people. He said, no, no, no. He said, you know, my father and the other speakers, the VIP, they're using the VIP elevator in the back. You should go in the back, use the VIP elevator. I said, but I am not with that conference. He said, but I think you should still use the VIP belt so people don't bother you, you know. I said, no. Then he says, by the way, where, where's your security guards? <laughs> you just walk around a hotel like this. I mean, you know, people like you don't walk around. Where, where, where's your security guard? Where's your, your protection? And I said, my wife is my security guard. <laughs> the people start clapping in the lobby. Yeah! Nobody has said that. And I was right, and I mean that. Because I don't trust no woman. I'm a gifted brother. Gifted. <laughs> and when they see me with her, they don't look at me. Keep, don't fool with me. I'm happy. I'm telling you, your gift will attract even some demons. Come on, talk to me. The Apostle Paul had a beautiful young lady, the Bible says, was following him. Beautiful lady, prophesying. I think she prophesied for some other reasons. Paul was an influential guy. And after three days, the Paul said, you know something? I think your attitude, your, your motive can't be right. And Paul said, you full of the devil. Her prophecies were right. She prophesied correctly, Paul says. But then her motive. 
It's demonic. Your gift attracts wealth and also affluence. When you have a gift and you ain't married, you can pick a juice. No one notices me. Well, I'm giving you a secret now. They can't find your gift. You dressing up, spending $20,000 on a hairstyle. And the people say, she ain't got nothing to offer. I don't want to sleep with no, you know, horse here. I want, I want the real thing. I want a gift. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble now, but hey. It's a singles conference 2008. We can be kind of real here. Bishop, what you say, Bishop? Yes, sir. What is your gift? It ain't, a, it ain't your face that attract people. Matter of fact, write this down. Very important. Proverbs 18, a very familiar verse. Verse 6, it says, A man's gift makes room for him where? In the world. But the second part is exciting. And it brings him before kings. Not you. The gift brings you in the presence of people. And listen, I like that. If you ain't married, you want to be bought in the presence of kings because you figure anyone in that room, you straight. <laughs> oh, you got to talk about it. <laughs> if, you start, if you keep attracting poor people, check what you show and what kind of gift you show. A poor gift. Poor people. I was telling the folks on the radio this week when they interviewed me, I said, you know, they, they were talking about, uh, what I was talking about? <laughs> you all remember the radio station this week? Flirting, flirting. Yeah, flirting. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Flirting. I said, okay. I said, you know, my mother taught, my sister here, my sister right here, she lived there. I have seven sisters. And I was a little boy. Hear my mother say, if any man you, don't look. And if he... Don't even give him the time of day. And I couldn't figure it out for a long time. Until it, it, it made sense. Anybody? <laughs> and some ladies look around and say, Hi! No, brother! No, 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 no. And now today, the brother's calling him dog. A dog. See? It's just gone there. Who are you attracting? Who is your gift bringing you before? Hoodlums? Wild women? Wayward women always coming to you? Strange men always being attracted to you? What are you showing? What, 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 what's the gift, or if any at all? What are you showing? Write this down. Your gift makes you more attractive than your looks. And I'm sure that Vicky would tell her story. I'm sure when before the week is out, she'd tell her story how she met her husband. But you know, it's amazing. You know, my wife was attracted to me because of what I was involved in. The vision is. She came to our concerts. And, you know, she wanted to, 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 to meet this person, this nice looking guy. And one time I decided I ain't sitting her no more. I decided that. When she wrote me one letter, that was a lovely letter. You ain't going nowhere, brother. <laughs> she caught my knees. Yee. She said, You're the best thing that I ever met. You're the best man I ever met. I said, Ooh, I can talk to this woman again. In other words, she saw gold leaving. <laughs> Come back here. You know, who do you attract? That's an important statement. You can could, you could wear a thousand million dollars worth of clothing and attract nobody. Except maybe... <laughs> Your gift. Your gift will bring you in the presence of prospects. It will bring you in the presence of prospects. So, Barbara, be careful. They come into the restaurant winking at you, hey? Use the manager. <laughs> 
see this lady? I like this picture. I, I, I got this picture for all of us. It's a, a positive woman. Strong. Affluence means, means that you are rich. But write this down. It means to be rich in personal confidence. To be affluent means that you are rich in personal motivation. You are rich in the sense of value. You value yourself. An affluent person is also rich in, a, in the sense of significance. They feel that they are important to life. That's what gives them the sense of affluence. An affluent person is also one with a sense of destiny. They have a feeling that they were born to change something in the world. Uh, an affluent person also has a sense of generational responsibility. I have to do something for the next generation. I can't live for myself. That's, that gives you influence and affluence. Number eight, an affluent person also has a sense of material comfort. In other words, they know how to make do until they can do better. That's why they keep attracting more. They manage resources properly. An affluent person is always in charge of their lives. I want to pray for you tonight. I said a lot of things tonight. It took me a lot of years to prepare for this one session because I had to learn these things myself. I am an example of everything I'm teaching here tonight. I still live on an island seven miles wide. I live 10 minutes from the place I grew up in, the low income area. And most of the folks I grew up with, they still there under the same tree, playing dominoes. And the only difference between me and them is I decided to pursue my gift, refine it. You still got your gift. You were born with it, and that's the good news. No one has to give it to you. So there's no excuse. God never told Adam to be seedful. Because he already had it. He said, be what? Fruitful. Bring forth what's on the inside. Here's something about a, a fruit tree. A mango tree will never, ever bring forth oranges. So whatever your seed is, that's the fruit you're supposed to bring forth. There's, there is a primary passion that you have that makes you singul singularly influential. And I pray, I say, God, what should we do tonight? He says, I want you to release the seed, bear it in people. Because that's the key to your singleness, your influence, and your affluence. Your seed attracts your wealth. And it keeps you free from economic crisis. As a matter of fact, no matter how bad the economy becomes, Dr. Simmons will still see them babies. No matter how bad the economy becomes, you're going to still need that lawyer. See, when, they, when you refine a seed, it protects itself from the economy. You can't really fire a doctor because he takes his medical knowledge with him. When they fire you, what do you take? Let's pray. Can you pray for yourself for a minute? First of all, forgive yourself. Just try that. The little things you don't like about yourself. Repent. Your nose too big, breast too big, legs bold, maybe too tall. I got long head, my eyes ain't right. I mean, a lot of stuff we don't like about ourselves. That makes you dangerous because you can't love anybody else either. Ask God to give you a revelation of where you came from. You came 
from him. You came from good stock. You ain't no rock. You are a God. Can I ask for a miracle tonight, Lord? Can I ask God to deliver you from your upbringing? Boy, that's a miracle. Can I ask God to deliver you from your neighborhood? The one that you were born in, where they, where they condition you to think a certain way? Can you ask God to set you free from your parents' words that are still shouting in your mind that you ain't nothing, you'll never be anything? You... Now you're 50, 60 years old and you still hear them words just like I told you you are and God is saying no you are who I said you are tonight you're still great can you ask him to give you love for yourself tonight that, that you never had before ask him to give you a, a love for his image in you and ask him to forgive you for devaluing his image whatever that was Can you, can you, let us leave this first night preparing for tomorrow, putting it all on the altar tonight. Can you do that? Let's put it on the mercy seat. Thank you, Jesus. Now, here's the toughest thing I saw in the spirit. If you want to make that change tonight, to fall in love with yourself, then I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you make some hard decisions it really doesn't matter what church you come from what family you came from tonight is about you and about love and about gift and about God Father do it tonight blessed be your name if you'd like to to get a revelation of where you came from and who you are you'd like to connect with your gift I'm going to ask you to come and stand with me right here in the front just come out of your seat and just walk tell your name excuse me let me get by this is a night of stirring up the gifts I'm going to pray a prayer that was prayed over me stir up the gift the secret to your future is in the gift that you carry it's not in your career it's not in your education it's not in and who you know is in your gift. And you don't need no one to give you no, no breaks in life and you know to, to try to sweet things. Your gift makes room. It opens doors for you. You know, I have never once asked anyone to invite me anywhere. Never once. Because they look for your gift. Can you come a little closer, please? Thank you, Jesus. When the Lord speaks to you, you should make a decision. I learned that. That's why I'm very obedient. When the Lord convicts me, I move right away. Sometimes the Lord will convict you on certain things and different people on other things. If you got convicted once tonight, you should be here. Just of anything that was said in this session if he caught you in any area just come right now don't even think about it just say Lord yes 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 I surrender that area to you I want to I want to love myself the Bible says if you hear his voice isn't that amazing because he knows that we hide in our hearts when we hear it if you hear my voice he says don't hide me heart heart means mind you know you start thinking I ain't going up there I don't want nobody to see me they can think I ain't right. No, no, no. If he, ha if he speaks to you, just respond. This conference is for, it's for all of us. Not many people with problems. All of us got problems. But we are not a problem. We have them. But we're not them. We want God to solve them. And he solves them by a surrender. Self-love. I want you to Tonight, listen to the words of this song. And let this song become your prayer. I want you to just 
bow your heads, close your eyes, and let, let this become a prayer. And as the Holy Spirit de deals with you, go ahead and do what he tells you to do. Sometimes he may tell you to cry, he may tell you to kneel, he may tell you to pray out loud, he may tell you just to moan, he may tell you just to, just to listen. But whatever it is, let him change yourself tonight. You will sell yourself cheap no longer. Tonight, God's putting you back in the diamond case. And your age have nothing to do with your value. Matter of fact, the older you are, the more precious you're supposed to become to the world. May God reveal your value to you. Let's listen. In the darkness where everything is unknown, I face the power of sin on my own. I did not know of a place I could go Where I could find a way to heal my wounded soul He said that I could come into His presence without fear Into this holy place where His mercy hovers
pray with me out loud. Heavenly Father, Thank you, Jesus. I want to love you. Teach me how to love you. Teach me how to pursue you. Teach me how to understand you. I want to know your nature. I want to know your character. I want to know who you are. I want to know you. I want to love you more. And teach me, Lord, about me. Show me my character. Show me my true nature. Let me see who I really am. Give me a revelation of who I am. I came out of you. I'm a piece of you. I came from my father. You are my father. I have your essence. I have your nature. I have your qualities. I have your character. I am worthy of love. I am worthy of value. I am important to the world. I have something to give. I love me. I love me because I love you. I am in your image. If I love you, I must love me. And if I love me, I must love every other image. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to me tonight. Forgive me for devaluing you by devaluing me. And tonight, I repent. I change my thinking. I am important. I am valuable. I am special. I am an answer. I am a solution. I came to the world to make a difference. I am full of love. I am full of love. I am full of love. And I love myself. And I love myself. And I love myself. And I reject every negative thought about myself. I renounce every negative word about myself. Tonight, on this spot, I am brand new. I am reconnected to my original self. I am in the image of God. I am a new creation. All things have passed away. Tonight, I'm a new creature. I have found myself. And from this day, Lord, I promise to learn to love myself more. Now put your right hand on your head. Put your hand on your hand on your head. Repeat after me, Heavenly Father. Stir up the gift within me by laying on of your own hands. Stir up my gift. Show me my gift. Reveal to me my gift. Show me what I was born to be, what I was born to do, what I was born to serve. I declare my gift is being stirred up now in the name of Jesus. Keep your hand on your head. Father, in Jesus' name right now, I pray for a kingdom miracle. Lord, set everyone free from their past oppression. And I release the gift within them by the authority invested in me by your kingdom. That I start the gift within them. Let their ideas and dreams and their passion emerge today, Lord. Sanctify that gift and let it come forth and impact their generation. And Father, wake up dead dreams and old dreams. Bring them back to life, Father, and let tonight be the beginning of a single, affluent, and influential human being in Jesus' name. And let the world never forget that we were here before we die. And may you receive all the glory for this new beginning in Jesus' name. Everybody shout amen. Hallelujah. Give God a big praise tonight. Hallelujah. This is the beginning tonight. This is where it begins. Now listen to me. I want you to do a couple of things as you leave today. I want you to make a commitment you're going to come to every session. Some of you didn't plan to do it. But this is too important of a few days for you not to be in this covering.